Do I go? Yeah, just say uh, welcome. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Hangout. This is a first for me. I'm in Waikato, Hamilton, uh, New Zealand. It's one o'clock in the afternoon and we're going to see how this goes. It's an exciting new endeavour. I'm speaking on the back of a series of public lectures I've been doing about Syria and the current situation and also a large number of media interviews I've been doing up and down the country. The starting point of today is I'll, I'll just talk about some of the recent developments of what's happened overnight and my thoughts of what's happening now. Um, the first one obviously is the Russian proposal to make this matter um, taken under an international auspice of disarmament of chemical weapons. The broad point I would make about this is that this is a, a very good initiative and we should be very grateful and happy that the, that the Russians are taking the lead in this debate. On a positive note, it's good because it gets the matter to the Security Council and all discussion of Syria previously has not been at the top table. And the other thing that's very good about this is the proposal to me, I'm in Waikato, Hamilton, uh, New Zealand. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we're going to see how this goes. I'm speaking on the bank on a series of public lectures I've been doing about Syria and the current situation, and also a large number of media interviews I've been doing up and down the country. The starting point of today is I've to make this matter um, keep the talk international forces book on the ground of chemical weapons. The broad point I would make about this is that this is a very good initiative. We should be very grateful and happy that the Russians are taking the lead in this debate. On a positive note, it's good because it gives the matter to the security and I'll turn down my speech. Hi folks, we're going, to, we're going to try again, we're having a few technological difficulties here, but I'm hoping it's all in good order now. Um, and so as I was saying with the Russian proposal, the, it's good because it's a security council and it's also good because they're talking about international control of serious nuclear weapons, um, sorry, chemical weapons. And this is important because had it just been a proposal for the Russians to oversee the disarmament and dismantling of them, or the Syrians, we would be very sceptical, but to get it under the international auspice is, is positive. The scepticism of which we must have with this is that to actually do this on a technological basis is very hard. The best precedent we have of how to disarm and dismantle safely chemical weapons comes from Libya. At the end of their conflict, it took them eight months to verify and collect what weapons they had, and the destruction of them will not be completed until the end of 2016. That, of course, is an ideal situation in that they are doing it without a civil war going on in the background. In this situation, there is a civil war, and the time frame means it could only be spilt out even longer. So that's the first thing we have to be skeptical of. The, the second thing that we should be skeptical of with the proposal is the current debate about using what's known as a Section 7 intervention. Section 7 under the Charter is whereby the use of force is authorised to go to war for an, an aggressive purpose. The resolution on the table that the Russians and the Americans are discussing has the French and the Americans saying we would like it to have a Section 7 reference 
What this means is that if Assad did not disarm as promised, it would be deemed a breach of international peace and security, and then a attack, a military use of force authorised by the Security Council, would be legitimate. If that happens, then we are following the exact same precedent with what happened with Saddam Hussein in 2003. There we had the first Gulf War, we had a promise that he would disarm um, his chemical weapons as well, and when he did not disarm his chemical weapons, um, the United States took it as under its own authority to strike um, Saddam Hussein and Iraq. There are, of course, very, very strong questions of the legality of this action, but that's the precedent that the French and the Americans are currently working on. Now, the other issue I wanted to briefly talk about um, before starting to answer some of the questions that have come in is what do we actually do from here? Because everyone right now has been focusing very strongly on the debate with regards to chemical weapons, and we've actually forgotten that the purpose of all this exercise is to find peace in the region. And the chemical weapons are just one small part of a very difficult equation. The, the equation consists of the, the type of crimes that are being committed and, and how we can move forward. And, on the topic of crimes, I think it's, it's a fair comment to say that the, there are criminals, lunatics, and fanatics on both sides, or all sides in this conflict. There is no monopoly on bad acts. There are crimes of war, there are crimes against humanity, there are crimes against heritage. It's, it's becoming extremely difficult in terms of the horror of this war. It's reaching levels which have been unseen for quite some time. And the only two conflicts I think which are comparable in this area are um, what happened in the Balkans and what happened in Sudan in terms of the United Nations intervention and interest. The point I want to add here about the crimes that we're seeing is that the evidence would suggest that the majority of the crimes are coming from um, governmental forces but by no means are these holding a monopoly on the crimes. On the topic of how do we find peace in this region, I think people need to start casting their minds to the future of how it may play out. And at some point, peace will come. And there's, there's two options here. The first option is that one side effectively wins and trumps the other side, and then you have a complete regime change or regime stability or you have a stalemate. I think it's likely at the moment we're going to be going towards a stalemate in time to come. It's, I come to this position because of the amount of weaponry which is going into Syria. Uh, the Russian weaponry is obviously providing the bullets for the Syrian regime, and the manpower is coming across from Lebanon and Hezbollah, and Syrian forces, despite early projections, are holding together quite well. On the opposing side, the rebel, the rebel soldiers are um, flush with volunteers. There's over 10,000 foreign volunteers there. There is no shortage of people willing to fight out of a population of 22 million. And the weaponry is now coming from a number of Middle Eastern countries and importantly from the United States. What this means is that it's more likely that the war will gridlock over a period of time. If it gridlocks, as opposed to that there being a victory for one side or the other, at a certain point, the international community will have to get involved and split the country apart. The two precedents where we've done this recently were in the Balkans, which had a death toll of 360,000 for intervention, and Sudan, which had a death toll of 200,000. To put that in perspective, the death toll at the moment in Syria is about 100,000, but the refugee count in the Sudan, in the Balkans, and in Syria is about the same. If we get to that point, if we get to that point whereby we have to divide the country, then we are in completely uncertain areas. But we have, in terms of the geographical distribution, but I do think it's the likely thing that we're going to have to be looking at in time to come. Okay, should I start answering some questions? Yes, please. Okay, so um, 
the questions that have come in so far, which I'll, I will just go through them um, from top to bottom. The first question I've got is, if Assad accepts Russia's proposal, would that signal he wasn't behind the chemical weapons attack? Um, I think in times of conflict, we should be skeptical of all sides. There, there is no um, good guy or bad guy when it comes to telling the truth. With regards to the weapons, I expect that the evidence is going to suggest that chemical weapons have been used. I think the evidence will tell us what type of chemical weapons, and these will be second generation chemical weapons, but it will be difficult for the evidence to say who used them. The only indication that we may want to bear in mind is that second generation chemical weapons are very difficult to weaponize. As in like Saddam Hussein wanted second generation chemical weapons of the type used most likely in Syria, but never had the ability to actually make them functional. So that's an indicator. Um, would it signal that he wasn't behind the chemical attacks? No, no not, not at all. I, I think it's, it's possible that the rebels used them. I think it's more likely that they've come from the government stockpiles. Um, second question. Why the big fuss about chemical weapons when conventional weapons have killed so many more people in Syria? Chemical weapons are a particular type of weapon which is different to everything else. They are prohibited because they are inhumane and they are prohibited because they are indiscriminate. They are the only class of weapon to actually fulfill both criteria. Um, in terms of inhumane weapons, the laws of war bans a series of types of weapons, such as dum-dum bullets, um, lasers which blind the opposition, and chemical weapons. Chemical weapons, the inhumane nature of chemical weapons is found in the way that they kill people. The, the first generation were, were choking agents, and where a victim would primarily choke to death, although the, the process of choking would um, take anything from six hours to 12 years. And, and so many of the victims of the First World War actually died in the decade after the First World War ended. Second generation chemical weapons are different. These are nerve agents of which um, a drop of the agent, depending which one it is, on your skin or um, vaporized if you breathe it in, it can even go in through your eyes it will eventually lead to paralysis of all your nerves, you will lose all bodily functions, and you will um, suffocate. It's a particularly brutal way to die. It, it, there's nothing dignified in it, or, nor quick. The indiscriminate nature of chemical weapons, in addition to the inhumane, is that for every attack, broad projections suggest, that for every soldier killed, 20 civilians will be killed. This figure can be much larger if it is in an urban environment. So it, but this is just a broad figure. It's the indiscriminate nature of chemical weapons which makes them illegal as a weapon of mass destruction. So they're inhumane and they're indiscriminate and together they are banned by a specific treaty called the Chemical Weapons Convention. And this is the second treaty following an earlier prohibition in 1925. The prohibition on chemical weapons makes them the most prohibited weapon on the planet. There are more prohibitions on chemical weapons than there are on biological weapons or nuclear weapons. Part of the reasoning why the international community is so concerned is that this type of chemical attack has never been used before on civilians. Whilst it is correct that um, chemical weapons were used by Saddam Hussein, they were first generation chemical weapons, they were not second generation chemical weapons. The use of second generation chemical weapons is new and novel. And to put that into some kind of historical perspective, the fear in the Second World War was that the opposing sides who both had chemical weapons would use high explosives when they bombed each other's cities and then to make sure that there were no survivors they would put down a layer of poison gas. 
the amazing thing about the Second World War is despite all of its atrocities, that fear never came to fruition. However, it would appear that Assad has crossed that boundary where it's been high explosives followed by chemical weapons. So this is why this is why the concern about chemical weapons trumps everything else, from landmines to cluster bombs to just um, rifles which spin bullets as opposed to shoot them straight. The third question is even if all chemical weapons are recovered from Syria, there's still the matter of the ongoing civil war. Who who ultimately wins that? Um, well, I I addressed that point when I started this talk, and as I suggest, I think what's most likely now is it will end up as a stalemate, whereby both sides um, fight each other to um, gridlock. Unfortunately, I think to do that, you're looking at the death toll having to almost be double what it is now. But the growth rate of the death toll is exponential, and, and we could get there very quickly. 200,000 dead people, 200,000 dead civilians, I should add, um, was the tipping point for the UN intervention eventually into the Sudan. The fourth question I have is that more than 30,000 Americans are killed each year, each year from um, small arms and, gun, and gunshots. Shouldn't they worry about cleaning up their own backyard before sticking their nose into someone else's? Um, it's for each country to regulate how it deals with its small arms, and I don't believe that any country has got a perfect social policy. The Americans certainly have to deal with their issue of the um, Second Amendment, as do all countries, although I hasten to add that it, whilst everyone is busy looking at a country like America and the problems that it has with small arms, a country like New Zealand has a higher rate of ownership per capita of weapons, although most of them are rifles, and they do actually in America. And just because a country has its own domestic problems, I do not think means that you should not be taking a leadership role in international affairs. On that point about a leadership role, I do think we have a legitimate expectation that countries in the West, like um, Britain, not like France, like the United States, will take the higher ground sometimes. I believe it's what the international community, I think it's what those who are vulnerable expect us to do. Having said that, Russia has now taken the high ground and we should applaud them for that. It's the responsibility of all of us to ensure that the international norms are upheld. Uh, question number five. What would be the likely fate of Syria's Christian population if, if Islamist rebels gained control of Syria? Um, this, th this question is a little bit blunt, and the reason I would say it's blunt is because people tend to see this conflict in Syria as being between Islamic fanatics and non-Islamic fanatics, of which people tend to assume that the Christians are there. And in fact, there are more layers of complication in the ethnic diversity of this place and the loyalties of each group than in most other conflicts. The, it's not so much a question of one type of Islamic group as multiple varieties of Islamic groups, some liberal, some less liberal than others, some orthodox but professing great support for secular concerns and even on the governmental side you will find fanatics as well so there's, there's no monopoly of fanaticism in this. Um, there is a legitimate concern with no matter who wins this conflict that there will be retribution and the retribution could come from government forces or it could come from the victors. At the moment the majority of the crimes being reported are coming out of government sources, so the government appears to be responsible for more crimes of war and crimes against humanity. Um, the next question, what would be the consequence for the US if it doesn't intervene in the situation? I think 
if there is no settlement, if the international community does not act, if Assad did, did not follow through on his commitment to do away with the weapons, the consequences for the US is that it looks weak. It, it looks like it, and I must be honest here, I think the United States has been outmaneuvered on the high diplomatic levels. I think Russia has completely grabbed the ascendancy here, and they are controlling this debate. America looks indecisive, and we can discuss that later about the, the American position and why Mr. Obama went down that route. But it makes America look the weaker of the international players. I think it can, to a degree, undermine its credibility. The primary reason that the American credibility may have been undermined was the decision to, by Obama to take the vote to Congress. And to, taking the vote to Congress in constitutional terms was a nice gesture because it looks like you're giving a lot of legitimacy to the discussion about whether you should go to war. Um, the American Constitution clearly places a heavy weight on Congress in such deliberations. And it's a, this is a very old tradition. It goes back to Greek and Roman times where the people are the ultimate arbiters of whether a country should go to war or not. The practice historically has been that when a president gives the matter to Congress, Congress affirms the president's desire and they go to war. In the case of the United States, it's happened 22 times. In 20, uh, 11 times, declaration of war approved, and 11 times, use of force also approved. Um, so if Obama went to Congress and got refused, it would look bad. It would be bad for the presidency, but it could be good for the constitutional process of the United States. Because it's bad for the presidency, or potentially bad for the presidency, that is why it has been the practice of pretty much all the American presidents when needed to avoid putting the vote to Congress. Over a hundred times of military use of force by the United States are done without recourse to Congress and the decisions are made to intervene or to engage in the conflict and they happen very quickly and Congress is not consulted. The American um, decision makers, the Senate and the House of Representatives, deeply dislike this process whereby a president can effectively do what they want with regards to dragging the country into war. It became particularly problematic with Vietnam and there have been a series of attempts with the War Powers Resolution to try to make them much more um, controlled than they have been in the past. The problem is, is that the presidents really don't care. The, the best example of this recently was with President Clinton and the intervention in Kosovo. Here, again, not authorised by the Security Council, but um, he decided to go in alone by himself and under the guise of a humanitarian intervention. So presidents, if they're not certain, don't give it to Congress. But if they do give it to Congress, then there's a risk in this instance he'll say no. I think what will happen now is if the Russian proposal does not play out then and Obama wants to get back involved in Syria, I doubt he'll give it back to Congress. But I may be wrong on that. Uh, I've got a live question from Joel on the screen. I've got a, a question here. Um, if the conflict stopped today, what will be the lasting impact on the region? Um, I don't think the conflict will stop today. I, I think this conflict's been going on for a fair time yet. I think when you see the region, we need to see a much bigger picture. And to me, the bigger picture here is not just that instability in Syria, but also the brewing conflict between Israel and Iran. And we also need to be conscious of considerations like what's been going on with the Arab Spring and the turmoil going on in countries like Egypt at the moment. The biggest concern here I have in terms of international peace and security is the other red line. When I say the other red line, Everyone knows about the red line, or remembers the red line that Obama talked about with the chemical weapons, but people have forgotten about the red line that was set by the Israeli Prime Minister with regards to the nuclear buildup of Iran. 
Iran remains in non-compliance with the international community as it moves towards its pursuit of nuclear weapons. And Israel has been very clear that it will not let this happen. At some point, unless there is a resolution of this conflict, it is quite possible that um, the conflict between Iran and Israel could kick off. And because Iran is linked to Lebanon, and Lebanon and Iran are both linked to Syria, the regional dynamics are still very unstable. So to, to answer the question, the lasting impact on the region, this is one small part of a very unstable place. Our goal right now has to be to try to stop the spread of conflict from Syria into other regions, but promising that spread has been part of the tactic of the Syrians the whole way through. Um, next question, uh, how can we be 100% sure it was the government, not the rebels, who used chemical weapons in attacks on civilians? We can't. But we, we will not be able to know for a long time who was responsible. I think at best we'll be able to identify if chemical weapons were used and what type of chemical weapons they were. As I said earlier, I think this means that for second generation chemical weapons, the difficulty of weaponizing them it suggests that it's more government forces than not. Having said that, it would not be impossible for rebels to have done that as well. Uh, next question. If the use of chemical weapons, is the use of chemical weapons the new benchmark for attracting US intervention? Um, yeah, it's certainly a, a benchmark of sorts. Yes, it is. As I said, it's because they're illegal, they're indiscriminate, and they are inhumane. And so this is the absolute threshold of prohibited weapons. The skeptic out there will say, well, this means, therefore, if these weapons are so bad, if you want to get America into a debate, then you should be using chemical weapons. And th th there may be a little of truth to that, but that's not an argument against um, why we shouldn't be concerned. How can a further chemical weapons attack be prevented? Uh, further question. Um, I think, well, the, 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 the way the, there's two arguments here. The, the first argument is what the Americans have said, and that is the threat of the use of force or prevent them from using um, chemical weapons again. Or the Russian approach, which is you should just disarm them and then remove the possibility. I like the second approach. I think if we can disarm them, it's a fantastic thing. Although I do believe you have to be concerned about the technological ability to do this. And the issue of verification is also a strong concern. Remembering, as I said, that the it was the inability to verify what Saddam Hussein was meant to have done with disarming and dismantling his chemical weapons that led to the Second Gulf War. To this day, we still don't know what happened to a lot of them. With Syria, the fear is that not only have the chemical weapons been decentralized within Syria, they may have been pushed across the border into Lebanon, in which case the chemical weapons were not so much being pointed at only the rebel-held areas in Syria, but also possibly cities in Israel as well. Uh, further question, um, how can the US justify intervention in Syria when atrocities in other countries go unpunished, such as the Congo and Palestine? Um, this is a, a question about international law and the Security Council. and Atrocities go get punished if there is an agreement. International atrocities, if they are a threat to um, international peace and security, and the Security Council agrees that they are a threat to international peace and security. So what this means is that if there's no veto put on them by the Security Council, then we will see the international community get engaged. So with the Congo, the, the international community is engaged, and within the last month, the, the peacekeepers have been reinforced and their mandate to use force has been increased. 
So I think we are engaged in the Congo. With Palestine, what you see is the difficulties of the Security Council, whereby the veto of one country, in this case the United States, ensures that any atrocities that occur tend to be invisible at the international level. This is not to say that all atrocities that Israel has been involved in with regard to the Palestine are invisible. Many of these are visible by the Security Council, but many aren't. Another example would be, say, something like Chechnya, whereby a, or Tibet for, with China, whereby a country can completely keep an international issue right off the agenda. Um, another question. The UN seems impotent in this conflict. Doesn't need to find different approaches to conflict. What might they be? Um, the Security Council does seem impotent in this conflict, but we need to, and, and this is a huge problem in international law, that sometimes you can see the most terrible things going on, which range from crimes of humanity all the way up to genocide, and the international community is impotent. And the reason it's impotent is because of the veto, whereby one country or two countries prevent international action going through. The answer to many people is that if that's the case, what we should do is remove the veto. The risk with that, and I honestly believe this is the bigger risk, is that when you do that, you forget why the Security Council was formed in the first place. The Security Council was formed after the Second World War, after the League of Nations failed. The purpose of the Security Council, and indeed the United Nations Charter, is to prevent the Third World War. And we, because of what happened in the First World War and the Second World War, then we had to create a mechanism whereby the most powerful people could control a situation. And as unpalatable as it has been, when it means that certain atrocities go past, the alternative of removing their veto could effectively tip the balance towards leading to a greater conflict. So we must be concerned there. Um, Another question, how much power does the UN have in this situation and what can they do? The, the power that the UN has in this situation comes down from the Security Council to get involved in someone else's war. If there is no UN authorization, then we can't do anything apart from humanitarian gestures like getting the Red Cross involved. And to get the Red Cross involved, you have to have the consent of the countries and um, belligerents involved in the engagement. What can they do? Well, it, if it's a low-level engagement, that they will tend to try to stay up. But when it becomes a civil war like this, when the death toll gets big enough, eventually the veto will stop, is, is the normal practice. The difficulty with that is that you're talking about a mathematical equation when at base you are talking about innocent civilians being killed. And th this is something which particularly concerns me because I have a tendency to slip into mathematical figures and grand numbers. But at base in all of this, what you're talking about is individuals, um, people, normal people, people who just want to pay their mortgage or people who just want to bring up their family or people who want to go to school. And so, yes, the tipping point for Sudan was 200,000. It was a similar figure for the Balkans. And you've got to get to a very high death toll before eventually the veto disappears. But even then, there's no guarantee that the veto will disappear, allowing an outside intervention. As I say, wars like Chechnya, wars like Vietnam, you have much higher death rates, but because of one country's control of the Security Council, the whole conflict is invisible. Um, do followers of Islam really need another excuse to hate the United States? Um, many followers of Islam do not. This, this is not a this is not a Islam pro-Islam anti-Islam type of debate. There are many different types of religious communities involved. The majority of the communities clearly are um, Muslim, but within the Muslim branches, there are a variety of different interpretations of their theological works.
they don't all agree. Some of the worst civil wars historically um, in both the Christian tradition and in the Muslim tradition have been interfaith wars. There is a degree of interfaith conflict going on here, but even within these people, they are not all of the same brush. There are Christians, there are Muslims, there are Sunni, there are Shiite, there are a whole collection. I don't think it's um, accurate to portray this as Muslim and anti-Muslim. There are, as I say, fanatics and criminals and lunatics on both sides. There, there's no monopoly here, but these are not just for Islamic groups, they can also be for Christian groups, and they can also be for government groups. Will the US intervention bring about any real change for the people of Syria? I think if we, we look at what's going on here and the possibility of real change, well, I think you've got to look at the long-term picture. And that apart from stopping the civil war, apart from building the peace, you have to look at some of the underlying considerations for why a region goes to war and how you can actually change those. I think in a time like the Middle East, what you're seeing is huge demographic change. The population is growing very quickly. I understand that 40% of the population is under the age of 25. I also understand that 30% of the population is below the poverty line. And so when you've got a huge amount of young people who are poor and unemployed, it doesn't matter what ethnicity they are or what religion they are or what political views they hold. Is that if you want to build peace, you have to build economic prosperity and economic opportunity in a lot of these countries. And what you see in a lot of the Middle East is despite a huge amount of largesse coming through from the oil revenues and other assistance over the years, is it has not been captured. And so unless you can rebuild a country economically as well as socially, and in that regard, you've got to be thinking about considerations of human rights, the rule of law, equality, then you are just going to get into a pattern where the conflict will continue. And this is um, obviously these considerations of equality, the rule of law, liberty as such. But this is a lot of language that came out from the Arab Spring. And I think it was easy to be very optimistic about these things in the Arab Spring. But these were not clearly articulated visions. More often than not, the supporters of the Arab Spring were reacting against tyranny, uh, of which much of the Middle East was in terms of either um, dictatorships or authoritarian monarchies, of which there was no democracy. And whilst I personally am a great fan of democracy and equality, I'm not certain that many people engaged with the Arab Spring share the same value structure. I was particularly disturbed over what happened in Egypt with the toppling of the democracy. And whilst I would agree that the democracy as it was operating was clearly problematic, I don't think it was correct to allow another military dictatorship to take it over. And I found the silence of the Western countries in the face of this is a particular hypocrisy. And so unfortunately, that kind of context for the war about the Arab Spring about democracy, I think now is somewhat shallow. What is the outlook for the Syrian refugees with or without US intervention? Bleak, to be honest. The outlook for, for refugees is bleak. You've got, you've got two types of refugees here. You've got internally displaced people and you've got externally displaced people. We tend to think of refugees as those who have moved beyond the border. The, the bleakness is due to two considerations. The first one is that the international community has currently got a very dim view of helping out refugees. Nations are increasingly intolerant and do not wish to allow refugees to come into their countries. There is a degree of fatigue so the take-up of refugee numbers is not great. 
The second reason why it is bleak is because many of these people will have lost their homes and depending on where they are in the conflict and where there may be an eventual peace settlement, they may never be able to return to what they once had and they may end up forfeiting um, or losing a huge amount of land. To put that into some kind of context, the people of Palestine have a legitimate grievance against the people of the government of Israel with regard to land that was taken in 1947, I understand, and also the 1967 war. And the refugees from those two conflicts, dating back now over half a century, continue to regard this as a legitimate grievance which can still upset the peace processes today. So it's bleak for the refugees and the likelihood that this could become a future sticking point also very difficult. The return of refugees was a very hard topic in the Balkans because when the peace settlement comes then the division of the land it can be very forthright and some people who once held something could be completely excluded. Where will the next Middle East war be? Will conflict increase? Um, I think, as I said, the, the, the one we've got to watch for the next Middle East war to be worried about is Iran and Israel. I think there is a strong likelihood that Israel will strike militarily against Iran as their nuclear capacity gets quite close. I think that will be the most likely external war. I think internally it's more likely that countries will implode than explode. I believe that Egypt, Iran, no sorry not Iran, Egypt, Iraq, Algeria are currently on the cusp of civil wars and the Egypt in particular Afghanistan, we, we'll have to wait to see until what actually happens there. I know it's not part of the region, but it's also unstable. Will, will conflict increase? Um, unless you can remove some of those base considerations for why conflict starts in the first place, then yes, it, it, it's, it's hard to fight against the tide. You've got to look at the economic considerations for why people fight. You've got to look at human rights you've got to look at considerations of equality. There are base things that all societies need to prosper. One of the most important things we know that will end conflict is that when democracy is imposed upon people or adopted by people, I should say adopted because you can't impose it, people have to grow into a democracy. But we know pretty clearly now that democracies very, very, very rarely ever fight other democracies. So one of the best guarantees that we can have of peace in this region and in any other parts of the world is to promote democracy. Democracies will fight authoritarian regimes, democracies will fight tyrants, but they will very, very rarely fight other democracies. So if you want to end conflict, we know what to do. But as I say, that's only part of the equation. Democracy is not the whole answer. It is also about economic considerations as well. It's about trying to deal with youth unemployment. It's about environmental standards. It's about ensuring that there are enough resources, not just in terms of monetary considerations, but also in terms of physical things, such as the distribution of water. And in the Middle East, we can see water also being a catalyst for conflict. Who has the world's largest stockpile of chemical weapons and why? Um, this was the Russians and the Americans, but and they held something like 95% of all of the chemical weapons in the world up until 1993. And between 1996 and 2012, they have been systematically destroyed. And it's been a long, slow process, but it's, it has been achieved. And it's almost completed now in the Soviet Union, uh, Russia. The difficulty with the stockpile of weapons is not just the actual munitions themselves. It's also with the precursors, which are the precursors of the chemicals that you actually mix into the chemical weapons to weaponize them. So you may have a thousand tons of sarin gas, but you would typically have about four thousand precursors to make the weapon. And you have to get rid of 
the precursors and the actual munitions as well. That's it. Fantastic. I've, I've, I've run out of questions. If there are no more questions, you can just thank the audience and keep going. Okay. Alrighty, folks. Well, that's it. That's um, Al Gillespie and my views on Syria. I hope it's been informative. Um, if you've got any more questions, just email me. I'm on azg at Waikato.